11 a.m. and I'm an early bird. So I am so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay, it's a joy. Over to you, Erica. Okay, thank you so much. Um, it is such a pleasure to meet all of you today. I wish I was able to be there in person, but I will happily meet you through Zoom. Um, as Dr. Oksana said, I am very interested in your institution and I came to know of you uh, through email and my affiliation with Watermark is one where I, I like educational technology very much and I love assessment. And so I'll be talking to you about institutional effectiveness in general um, and that can uh, be managed in part through a technological platform such as Watermark, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of leave things open. And if you have any questions at any time, feel free to ask. I'm happy to answer anything um, you can. Um, I have shared my screen, I believe. So you should be seeing my second slide right now. So before we get into institutional effectiveness, I wanted to open up with a little bit of a diagram because I find that it is much more helpful uh, to, to sort of draw concepts. And so to me, institutional effectiveness is predicated on really four things, strategic planning, assessment of learning, which I heard uh, Dr. Trimble talking about as I, as I signed on this morning and strongly agree with everything he has said, and then academic program review. And I guess it could be program review of non-academic programs as well if you had services for students that you wanted to incorporate in your um, assessment planning, but basically it's these three things, having a plan, assessing learning, and reviewing programs. Uh, program review incorporates student learning assessment, but it's not limited to student learning assessment. You can also factor in things like the sufficiency number of your faculty, the resources that are provided to them so that they can do their important work. And so that's why I don't have assessment and program review as exactly the same thing, um, because you can make decisions about what's included in your process, and it may look different at different institutions. Undergirding those three things, strategic planning, assessment of learning, and program review, is your institutional research data. And so it's really important to have a strong institutional research function to help provide information, because you need information to plan, you need information to do assessment, and you need information for your program review process. And we'll get into institutional effectiveness in just a second. But I wanted to start off with this graphic because I think it helps put these concepts together. You need all three, strategic planning, assessment of learning, and program review to get to institutional effectiveness. And your institutional research office or, or person is going to be instrumental in helping you do that work. So, what does institutional effectiveness mean? There's a lot of different definitions. Um, if I was in person, I would probably be polling you and asking you to share with me, um, but I will push forward and actually use your mission as a way to think about this concept. And I'm gonna ask you to kind of read along with me. So when I went to your website in preparation for the session today, I saw the mission of Foreman Christian College, a chartered university, is to impart, create, and disseminate knowledge and to develop informed, ethical, and responsible citizens who are prepared to and committed to learn, lead, and serve persons who exemplify the FCCU motto, by love, serve one another. And while I recognize that that may not encompass everything that you care about doing as an institution, that's gonna be a very important straight statement and should be guiding your assessment efforts, your strategic planning and your program review to think about the extent to which your programs and services support this mission, okay? And so I'm gonna pull your mission apart for just a second and we'll dig into it a little bit more. So this is based on what I saw in your mission, the things your institution cares about. The wonderful part about institutional effectiveness is, the definition is not monolithic. It will mean different things at different institutions. So let me give you an example. I work for Kent State University, which is in Ohio in the United States. We are not the largest university in our state, but we are, I think, third place right now. 
the biggest institution in our state, which you may have heard of, you may not have, is Ohio State University. They are the top tier research institution in our state. They are very selective. They do not take every student that applies. They are um, federally funded in a way that we are not. We get money, but not the same money they get. And that informs their mission. By contrast, we are serving a quarter, a fourth of the state generally. We have students from 99 countries, but we are really focused on serving the state of Ohio. And to do that, we try to admit as many students as possible, regardless of their academic preparation. Our mission is different than Ohio State University. And so from the institutional effectiveness perspective, we care very deeply about making sure that we meet students where they are academically and help them be successful where another institution such as Ohio State may not value that in the same way because that's not the landscape in which they operate. And so the definition of institutional effectiveness at Kent State is going to be different than the other institutions in the state of Ohio particularly Ohio State. Um, we're not Harvard University. We know that, and that's okay. We're not trying to be. And so when you think about institutional effectiveness at your institution, you need to think about what it means to do the best work you possibly can in your context. And so to do that, I pulled your mission statement. And what I see in your mission statement are the following things that you care very deeply about student success. And that can be thought of in terms of their knowledge, their skills, and the dispositions or traits that they emulate. Examples, writing, oral, and quantitative skills. I saw that in your goals, that you're very uh, focused on making sure your students are effective writers, that they can effectively communicate orally and can manifest quantitative skills. I also saw a theme of information literacy, that you want your students to be able to critically analyze different sources of information, determine which is the best, and use them effectively. And it was also very clear from your website that you are interested in creating ethical and responsible citizens that act in accordance with your motto. And so those three things, writing knowledge and skill, oral knowledge skill, quantitative skill, that tends to be that knowledge and skill stuff, the other things are more trait-based, that you're trying to create lifelong learners, people who are dedicated colleagues. And so those, to me, are the main student-facing institutional effectiveness things that your institution is focused on. That does not mean those are the only things you're doing, but those themes should run through every academic program that you have. The other things that I saw on your website was a focus on regional academic, economic, and social development impact. And so while those may happen through your students, they may happen because your students are good students and, and graduate and become very successful, that may also refer to the activities of your institutions in serving the local community. And so if that's providing programming or economic support, social programs, that can be part of your institutional effectiveness planning. And also I saw that you're very interested in making sure that you have a strong reputation for education. That can also be part of your institutional effectiveness picture. And so I'm going to pause for a moment and ask you to think, maybe in the context of your academic program, but maybe just in general, is there anything that Foreman is really focused on doing that maybe isn't listed in the mission that you want to make sure in future conversations are part of the concept of institutional effectiveness at your organization. If you have other ideas, if you want to add to this list, it would be very helpful for you to share your thoughts with your administrators because it may help your assessment planning and program review efforts in the future. So let's talk about how this interacts with accreditation. We've talked about the concept of institutional effectiveness, but then sort of why does it, why do we have to have this conversation at all? 
You are currently affiliated with the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan, and they have 11 standards. I've not put all the standards on here. Um, it was quite a list, and I'm glad. Um, it, it's nice to have a, a body such as this to help you organize and attest your quality. But I saw six different standards of the 11 that might intersect with the work of institutional effectiveness. Having a mission statement and goals, that's critical, a very primary step because it defines what you do. Engaging in planning and evaluation, that's effectively assessment. It's deciding what you're doing, doing it, and then measuring whether or not it happened and how well it went. Having integrity, this doesn't seem like maybe something that's off, off the, the bat or immediately aligned with institutional effectiveness, but it comes in the reporting. And actually, as I signed on, Dr. Trimble was talking about something very similar to this. He said that um, when you are talking about assessment or talking about how students are performing in your programs, you can't always find that everything is perfect. Because if you do, your accreditor is going to say, well, your standards are too low, or perhaps you're not reporting everything accurately. And so being able to demonstrate integrity by identifying challenges that you're going to work on in the future shows institutional integrity. Um, academic programs and curriculum, that's very important in a program review process. Public disclosure and transparency, similarly, is about integrity, program review, assessment of learning, and, and making sure that, uh, the, that the outside world understands how effective you are, and then assessment and quality assurance. So all of these standards are telling you institutional effectiveness as delivered by planning, assessment, and program review are incredibly important. Similarly, and this is a little bit more of what I know more about is NECHI, the New England Commission of Higher Education. They have nine standards and five of them basically call into play institutional effectiveness. Um, just a piece of background, I get called a lot by institutions internationally when they are seeking U.S. accreditation to ask, you know, what do we need to do to make sure that the accreditor in the United States understands what we're doing? And so what, that's why I asked, oh, are you looking to be accredited in the United States? The process differs from what you're likely going through with HEC, but the standards and the concepts are very similar. And so they want to make sure that you're engaged in having a mission and goals and know what you're trying to accomplish, which is the baseline, the foundation of institutional effectiveness, that you're engaging in planning evaluation, that you have defined academic programs with outcomes, that you're being effective educationally, so that's assessment of student learning and program review, and that you are engaging with integrity, transparency, and public disclosure, which sounds a lot like what HEC was asking you to do as well. And so if you're engaged in this institutional effectiveness work, you are very much on your way. And so now we get to the tough stuff. So we now know what institutional effectiveness is. I'm sure you understand the concept, but the challenges to that, I see five. First, defining what is good enough. So it's one thing to say we want our students to communicate well in the written form or orally, but what is good enough? What is your target? And so you have to decide that. And I would recommend doing so at the academic program level for academic program specific knowledge and skill, and at the institution level for skills that cut across programs. And so writing might be an institution level decision, but uh, knowledge of business might happen in the business school, if that makes sense. You also have to decide what evidence you can co collect that would verify success or what is good enough. Does that evidence vary by academic program? I would argue that sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. There may be skills that are taught that are universal across all programs, and for that, your evidence might be the same across all programs. And then there may be knowledge and skills that vary by academic program, and each academic program might have different evidence for that. Another challenge of evaluating institutional effectiveness is how to manage the data that you collected. By definition, you're going to have a lot of information to weed through in order to make an argument that you are being successful in assessing student learning. And we'll talk about that in just a second, but I will give you a hint. That's where the technology plays in. 
The other challenges are how you can summarize the success of an entire institution with so many different programs and goals, and how do you address or act on areas for improvement? And I will talk about those in just a moment. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about program review and accreditation because I think they help address the challenges I presented on the previous slide. And I've made this PowerPoint presentation available. So if you would like to have a copy, you can absolutely do that. But program review. So program review is the practice of essentially engaging in a self-study at the academic program level rather than the institution as a whole to identify the current status of the program, who are your faculty, where are your students coming from, their academic preparation, the curriculum under which they study, their success in the curriculum. And it can incorporate a bunch of other things depending on what your organization cares about. At my organization, we have a lot in our program reviews about um, the amount of publication and research presentations our faculty engage in. If that's important to your organization, that might be in your academic program review as well. We also have a lot of budgetary information in ours to try to verify the extent to which the program is being effective with the money that they are allocated each year. That may not be a part of your program review process and that's okay. Um, one thing I will say is, and this is to underscore Dr. Trimble's point earlier, faculty are not evaluated as part of program review. Uh, assessment should not be punitive ever. Assessment should identify areas that in which things can be improved, but you should never get in trouble because of assessment. It should simply identify ways that things can uh, be better supported by the administration. So academic program review allows individual programs or unit to determine first what is good enough. And so this is where you would say, um, the students in our business program, when they are finished, should be able to write a business plan to secure funding from an outside organization or something like that. They should be able to write a term paper. They should be able to, and you can fill in the blank and come up with a whole lot of things that someone should be able to do when they finish a degree program. And so the first step is deciding what, what are those things? And that may be part of your assessment planning because it's the same process. Um, program review also allows programs to determine and collect the evidence of success. It's assessment planning. So you need to know, okay, well, if a, a student in a business program needs to be able to write a business plan at the end, what, what, what would be the evidence we would use of the business plan? It could be testing, it could be presentations, it could be uh, successful employment outcomes. There's all sorts of different evidence you can use for that. Just as a sidebar, accreditors expect and respect program review processes. And what I mean by that is most accreditors, I think NETCHI included, expect that an organization is engaging in academic program review as a foundational component of their institutional effectiveness efforts. And so if you're not doing regular program review, you will not be accredited. And I can actually tell a story of an institution, a college that's about 45 minutes from where I live, they had an academic program review process and their provost uh, left, their senior academic vice president left the institution to go somewhere else. And when they left, people forgot to do the academic program reviews. They almost lost their accreditation over it. Um, academic program review is a very serious business and the accreditors take it very seriously, but they also trust the results. And so doing program review is nothing but beneficial, right? It helps you get accreditation and the accreditor will believe when you go through your program review process and explain what you did. Generally speaking, they believe you and trust that your programs are of sufficient quality as long as you're occasionally identifying things that could go better that you're gonna work on. So what they're looking for in an academic program review process is that the program reviews are con conducted on a consistent schedule. So is it once every five years, once every three years? that they include clear goals, what is good enough for student success. They rely on good evidence, which necessarily brings in your institutional research uh, group and incorporates a peer review process. And I'm happy to talk about that more if that's not a familiar concept. Um, but what's critical is in an academic program review process, you have action items, things that maybe could be improved that the program is going to work on in between the program review now and the next program review cycle. 
technology. I know I've been talking almost 20 minutes and I haven't really gotten to technology yet. Um, I understand that you're going to be implementing watermark products or already have. Um, technology is the way to make sense of a lot of this information. And so if you think about it, all these programs that you have, you're all going to be submitting information that it's going to be a complicated to analyze, not necessarily from a statistical standpoint, just from a volume perspective. You will have so much information. Technology helps you manage the data that you collect, um, whether it's Watermark or another product. Assessment management systems can serve as a repository for data uh, from a student learning side, institution side, and for future planning. So that's a system in which you can say, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And then in subsequent years, report on how those different things went. Technology can also help you summarize the success of an entire institution with many different programs and goals. Assessment management systems have uh, dashboards built in that allow you to, at a glance, look at a bunch of different programs at a high level and say, oh, well, this is going well. This is maybe an area for concern. Um, they can be very helpful when they're set up well. Um, in I all I would say about that is they're very hard to set up well, but I you know it's it's totally possible to do. It just takes a while. It takes a lot of work. Um, so I respect any institutional research or assessment personnel engaged in that work. It's very challenging. And finally, technology can help you track your actions to address areas for improvement. As I said a minute ago, it's all about planning what you're going to do and then proving that you did it. And so the assessment management system allows you to do both of those things because you can log the actions that you've taken. So to bring this all kind of together and try to piece together the idea of institutional effectiveness, accreditation, program review, and technology, your accreditor is going to be concerned with the stuff on the left-hand side of the slide, but all the way across. But start with, have you defined what success is? Do you know what institutional effectiveness is? And that definition can be defined by your organization. So to me, it looks like knowledge, skills, and dispositions of students, regional impact, and strong academic or educational reputation. That's what I saw in your mission. There may be other stuff. Then when you know what success means, are you collecting data to determine how successful you're being on the items that you've identified? And then are you analyzing the data? So that's the middle part of this diagram. First, know what success is, then are you collecting data and analyzing it to determine how things are going? And then finally, do you have mechanisms in place for transparency, making sure that people understand when there's a problem and taking actions to improve? So to me, that's how all of these concepts fit together. That is the conclusion of my presentation. I don't know if we've built in time for questions, but I'm happy to take anything um, from you and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Erica. It seems like you were right here and you were going through, uh, you know, exactly what FCC is about. And I think you have given some food for thought about what is it that we want? What is the goal that we want to work towards? I would, um, you talked about peer mentoring. May I sort of indulge you to talk about uh, the peer uh, assessment, sorry, role that you talked about a bit, please. Oh, being peer reviewers? Yes. Okay. So in a program review process, at least at, um, like at my institution, what we do is each academic program area writes their review, and we are on a seven-year cycle. Um, that's something that the state of Ohio has helped us decide. So we only, once every seven years, we will write an academic program review. And we're all in different schedules because we only have an office of four people doing the academic program review management, which at an organization of our size is, is very small. Um, so each program writes our academic program review every seven years, and as part of that process, when we're putting together this big packet of information, we identify uh, institutions to which we aspire. So maybe um, a Kent State University might aspire to be more like Michigan State University and Clemson University and um, Stanford University, which we wouldn't, but just put it out there. Um, what we would then do is find faculty in our discipline at those institutions, and they would actually review our program review materials. 
We would also have someone internal. So um, our last program review, I think we had someone from Michigan State, University of Indiana, or Indiana University, I'm sorry, and Penn State University. And then we had someone from our college and they reviewed all of our materials and talked with us about them to say, okay, we see what you're doing. It looks like things are going well here, here, and here, but maybe not going so well here, here, and here. Here are the actions we think you should take if you want to be more like us. And mm. it's not always about being more like other institutions. It could be about being the best version of yourself. But that was simply what our organization chose to do. Other universities in our area do not bring in external peer reviewers. They simply bring in faculty from other areas of the institution to review the evidence and say, oh, well, this makes sense. This doesn't make sense. We would like you to give us more information on this or maybe focus on this area a little bit more in the future. Um, oftentimes, the faculty are asked to provide their own recommendations because the very act of writing the program review often identifies or helps them identify areas that they would like to focus more on in the future. Because anytime you write a document like that and are engaging in reflection, you think, oh, it might be nice to do this, that, or the other. And so they write that into the program review from the very beginning. But it's never a punitive process. We've never closed a program or uh, gotten rid of faculty or anything like that based on a program review. Okay, so, uh, and does it mean that all the institutions that you ask for peer review are actually uh, going for the same accreditation or is it irrespective of that? Okay. It is totally different. Okay, so I'll see if there are other questions from the audience. A lot of our, uh, there are two rooms. I th I wonder if you can see both the rooms. Uh, um, I I can see you, but I cannot see all the other rooms. Let me make my screen okay. bigger. Maybe I can. So th there are two. There's one room that this is where we are. I wonder if you can see us on the. You can see me, but I think you need to see the um, the audience. And then there is another room. There's uh, half of some of the faculty are over there, and some are on Zoom. So okay. there are 45 here. Gee. If you can call on people, um, I well, I see Abdul Ghani Rel um, has yes. a hand up. Yes, I, I see that somebody raised a hand. Abdul Ghani, is it? Yes, I am. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I have a question that sometimes from the bottom of uh, up from faculty point of view, we have rubrics and we have assessment criteria of our courses, our teaching learning activities, but from the top down when we see that uh, we do have objectives or university goals, but um, uh, I think that we need to work on our benchmarking and mm -hmm. our uh, standards that what does it mean to be success? When you say that, do we have a clarity of the success? It means that we need to have clear cut benchmarking and then we need to communicate to the faculty that what do we mean when we say that our goals are to uh, develop informed, ethical, and responsible citizens. But uh, if uh, if there is a missing benchmarking area, then how do you suggest that we should work on that? Sure. Um, I'll make a couple of comments because I, I love that you already have rubrics and measurements in place. Uh, sometimes when I talk to people, they or organizations, they don't have those things. So um, I applaud that you're already doing this important work. There's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, at the academic program review, er, academic program level, I would encourage the program to define their own uh, for program specific things. So, for example, on your rubrics, maybe um, a certain level of performance on the rubric is the acceptable level, and that may be what you're already doing. I would simply say to formalize that process. And so, your benchmark for success on something might be that 85% of students achieve at a certain level on a rubric. Uh, for certain criteria, and that would be completely sufficient. But for objectives or goals that cut across the institution at a higher level, um, that every student is expected to uh, maybe perform at, that might be a conversation for a university-wide committee where you uh, determine like what does success look like, and then ask program areas, are you already measuring that? And if so, how does your measure align with maybe our, our vision for 
for success because you may already be collecting the data. It's just translating, well, for this program, it'll look like this. And for this other program, it'll look like this. And it's okay if it's different. As long as you've got some concordance, some correspondence in the measure, the, the sophistication of the behavior. It, does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it is. The point is, the accreditor is actually okay with you making the decision as long as you can demonstrate to them that you had a conversation and thought about it. They really, like, they don't want to come in and and tell you, no, you didn't try hard enough. They just want to have evidence that you had a conversation and really thought about what you were doing, that you were intentional with your actions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Do I see any other hands? I I think, uh, yes. Dildar, please. We have, uh, that was Hafiz Ghani, the head of religious studies who just asked in question, Erica, now we have Dildar okay. from chemistry department. Hello. Okay. Hello. I'm Dr. Dildar. My question is that generally what we do is the internal evaluation. That okay. is, we the teachers are the faculty, we teach the courses and then do the evaluation. And when we are evaluating the program, we do the same thing. That is, we the faculty, who set the goals and the objectives, and then we measure them. And ultimately we draw the conclusions. Uh, what about the external evaluation? Somehow how to make sure that what we are evaluating is, is, is appropriate or uh, you can say reliable. So have you got my point? That is the, that is a, the third party evaluation or external evaluation. Uh, that is, how can we make sure that what we are doing is, is appropriate or reliable? Sure. There's a couple of answers to that. And I guess I, I would ask sort of a question. I'll answer it two different ways. So if, if the question is about the accurate evaluation of specific evidence, I think having another evaluator is really, um, really helpful in doing that. If you're talking about big level program evidence where you're looking at the entire program at the same time, what I would try to do is find an external evaluator, and it could be within your institution or at another institution. It doesn't have to be outside, but somebody who is not your friend necessarily, and simply try to find someone that will give good critical evidence that is not um, affiliated with the program area if possible. Now, I recognize that that can be challenging because they may not be an expert in the discipline. Um, earlier, th thinking about chemistry, I don't have uh, great expertise in chemistry. I didn't do very well in chemistry in secondary school and certainly did not attempt it in post-secondary education with my experience being not so great in high school, right? But if an argument or a program review is written carefully and it avoids jargon language then or discipline specific language, an external evaluator can successfully go in and look at the degree to which students meant benchmarks. It's, it's, it's about um, the way that the program review is written. And so if within discipline and you're looking at um, evaluation of student learning evidence, such as a portfolio or a performance assessment of other variety, and you simply want to make sure that you are being consistent in your grading or marking strategy, having somebody within your discipline is very helpful. But if we're pulling back and looking at general student success in an academic program, as long as it's somebody who is not affiliated with the program and is from outside, it could be um, somebody in chemistry gets someone from um, business, that would be sufficient uh, to do that. I hope I answered your question. And if I didn't, please feel free to tell me. No, I think that was quite clear. We have another, two more questions coming up. Der, Derek Becker, he is uh, the head of environmental sciences. You... Yeah, the, the, Dr. Erica, um, uh, following on from Dr. Dildar's question or, or comment about um, a, a third party assessment, in, in your experience, do you use uh, the experience of, of uh, graduated students um, uh, in, include that in your uh, institutional effectiveness in, in terms of job placement, uh, relevant job placement, not just any job, relevant job placement, uh, satisfaction of the uh, educational experience. And then that type of um, surveys, 
in, in uh-huh. your graduated students? Yeah. Yeah, great question. So we tend to use that as secondary evidence, and I'm not suggesting it isn't important because you, you learn different things from different data collections. So our educator preparation or teacher preparation programs, um, we do a lot of assessment of student learning while they're in our program. So, you know, as their pre-service early teachers before they graduate, we evaluate their dispositions, their knowledge, their skills in five different ways. And then once they graduate, we attempt to survey them. Um, we also do employment employer surveys where they call their, the people who um, are paying them to teach and ask them you know, what they think and how it's going. We also bring uh, former students in um, for focus groups and ask them how they're doing. We um, during their internship at the end of their program, we also ask their supervisors how they're doing. So, yes, we 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 use both. What I would say is accreditors tend to want evidence of student learning from student assignments or the faculty evaluating the students while they're in situ. But we have found extraordinarily uh, important things in our surveys and focus groups. Now, one thing about focus groups, because I actually like focus groups better than surveys, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, They are hard to get people to participate in, at least in our context. When we send out a survey, we're happy if we get a 10% response rate. With focus groups, if you can actually get a hold of the students, they tend to be very excited that they, sorry, alumni, it's not students. The alumni are very excited to come back and talk to us. And we do them virtually through Zoom, but they're excited that we care enough about how they're doing now to get their feedback. And so while the accreditor probably doesn't get as excited about that evidence, we have learned so much more from focus groups because we're going to fo- we focus on students that have been out for two to five years. And the reason we use that is we want them to have two years in the field doing their work to give them a chance to be able to reflect almost as an external third party on the quality of their program, that they've had time to think about, oh, I wish I'd learned this or, oh, I'm really struggling with that or, oh, I'm I'm so much better at this one thing than my colleagues or whatever. And so um, doing focus groups of alumni two to five years post completion, we feel is probably the best way to get feedback on how the program as a whole could improve. And sometimes we get information like, oh, you know, I really didn't like the academic advising. I didn't know what classes to take. But usually it's, oh, I wish I had been better prepared to teach with technology or I really didn't know how to handle um, having so many different types of students in my class at the same time. And that was it's been incredibly helpful when we've made program changes from that. And we put that in our accreditation reports. And, you know, it tends to go very well because it's important to identify areas of improvement. Yeah. I thank you so much. That was mm-hmm. very helpful. I see another question from Christy Munir. He's on chemistry, right? Uh, He's an old, uh, has been here with us for a long time, trying to steer us <laughs> to improve all the time. He's one of the G. I, I, I'm sorry I said mean things about chemistry. I, I, I have lots of respect for chemistry. I'm just not good at <laughs> and it. Okay. 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 <laughs> I'm a chemistry teacher. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm given some syllabi to teach. I teach that. Okay. I don't know how to evaluate it. But there is a, a big need that we can train them, teach them, and make a product which has FCC core values. How do I do it? I can do it. I can do chemistry. I can do physics. I can do mathematics. I perhaps can do some other subjects as well. But how do I do it? And then quantitatively measure those. Sure. That's my need in the the context of Pakistan. Yes. Yes. Thank Thank you for the question. I'm going to suggest that you don't have to measure every item in every class. And there's just certain format or certain places where it may not make sense to do that. Um, When I think about the things that are in your mission, I think about those that that might end up in more writing focused um, types of uh, 
projects, uh, presentations where students explain uh, their their way of acting or the, the perspective that they bring. And so in a chemistry course where you're focusing on um, knowledge and skills on a testing format, that may not be a great place to uh, focus on the um, ethical aspects of your organization. One thing that does tend to work pretty well on tests, but it has to be germane to your class content. And if it's not, that's okay, because you don't have to do every aspect of the mission in every single course, that divide and conquer, as they say. Um, but you could use scenario-based prompts. So a case study of, you know, this is happening. Uh, I'm thinking, and please forgive me, because chemistry is not my thing, but I, again, respect it. But maybe you have a scenario where uh, you tell a story of a, a student's in a lab and they're working on something and they're put into some sort of situation where they have to make a, a decision on whether something they, they believe is ethical or not. And so you could have a, a scenario-based question and a test. But I would agree that I don't necessarily think a chemistry test is the place to evaluate whether students are developing ethically and morally in accordance with FCCU's mission. And that is completely okay. Um, if you assessed every aspect of your mission in every single class, um, you would spend a lot of time creating measurements that aren't super relevant to the content. And that, you know, doesn't have to happen. So be strategic. Students are taking a lot of courses as part of their academic program. And so across the academic program, they should be getting all of those things, but they don't have to get them in every course. Yeah. yeah. Not in <laughs> <laughs> I think I heard that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's another question from sciences. You were getting all the sciences, Erica, yeah. not, not cabbage, biological sciences. Perhaps you were better in that. I, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> My uh, dominant. Professor X uh, gives a lot of A's to the students, and Professor Y is uh, not giving good grades, he's going B, and he's very careful in giving grades. So, do you think that they have the same value, A of Professor X and B of Professor Y? It's a great question. Yeah. So, I, I would say that I try not to use grades as evidence of student learning, right? Grades are evidence of behavior, at least in theory, and different faculty will grade students differently as a concept based on the behavior that they value. So in my courses, I grade students on participation because I feel that class citizenship is extraordinarily important. If you are not contributing to the classroom discussion, if you're just sitting there, waiting for other people to talk, you're not gonna do well in my class because I think we have to learn from each other. Other faculty members disagree with me completely and that's okay. So that I don't use grades as a representation of student learning, it's a representation of behavior to me. And so generally speaking, I tell people to avoid putting them in academic program reviews or accreditation reports. Um, that is not a view that everyone shares, though. And so um, if your institution has a very strong uh, feeling on what should be included in grades and what shouldn't, then that's on them. But for me, I don't use grades as evidence of student learning for exactly that reason, because there's not a ton of consistency across faculty members, even in the same program. Yeah. I think that was a very valid uh, point, and that is what has bothered our faculty because there's a great variation across uh, sure. different, even when they are teaching the same course. Uh, I don't see any more questions. I think it was uh, in the other room. Okay, I don't see a hand here, but. Uh, I'm the voice is not very clear, please. Okay. okay. Uh, my question is that if I am teaching Salesforce management, I'm a business faculty, and I teach within the class and I send students outside for the practical reasons. So do you think we should increase the credit hours when they have a lot of outdoor work, which is practical in nature? We should they have because the students have said that there's a lot of workload that increases and at the end it's only three credit hours course. So 
students are not that motivated to be part of it. So is there anything that you think could be done? Uh, is it possible to repeat the, I'm sorry. I, and I know you gave me a lot of context. I couldn't hear well enough. I'm so sorry. No, Erica, I think we'll take a pause over there. I'll tell uh, Anish in the other room to perhaps uh, re-ask the question and perhaps the mic is too close. And that's why there was an echo and we couldn't hear it as well either. So that's okay. So if you could keep the mic a bit away and ask the question slowly and clearly, please. My question is that I'm teaching Salesforce management in the business department, and my course is practical work as well, outdoor and inside the theory as well. So my students, because it was only three credit hours, and I, sorry, I'll have to stop you there. Could you just come to this room and we'll wait for you in the meantime? If you could type the question in the chat, but she's not on Zoom. She is uh, sitting like you. Uh, okay. If you could come uh, to uh, E25, which is close by, we are happy to. If, if you heard it better than, if you heard it better than me, if you want to type it, I don't know if Anish, if you heard it, I'm sorry. No. I'm so no. sorry. No, we can't hear it either, Erica. And doesn't happen. There was a question from the other room and that was quite clear. We are happy to have you in this room. Please come over. Uh, in the meantime, I'd, uh, since there are no more questions, yeah, oh, Dr. Trimble has a question. So he's, Benji, that would be better. There's no screen. Hello, Erica. Hello. Yeah. This is Doug. Um, I was wondering um, about, um, you said that, that Kent State is on a seven year cycle for mm -hmm. program review. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned three years, you mentioned five years. Uh, the, the HEC is asking for the self-assessment report, which is like a program review, but not quite as intense uh, on an annual basis. Um, so that, that's a little bit frequent. Um, if you were designing a, the optimum frequency uh, program review, what would you recommend? I'm going to give a complicated answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> but what I would say is I think a five-year program review cycle is probably best for a, I'll say, a full program review and then maybe a miniature program review every three years, just to make sure that things are continuing to progress. And so maybe 50% of the work, well, no, then I need to probably do it a six year cycle because you'd want the three year, then a six year, then three more years and a six year. So we'll go six year and three year where you'd have a small program review every three years, very basic information, just sort of maintenance. And then the full, really thoughtful, detailed program review every six years. I am familiar with organizations that want annual reports, and I know why they do it. They want to make sure that you don't forget that you're keeping up with things. Um, I feel like we're all adults and we should be able to be left to our own devices for at least a couple of years, but that's not the opinions of everyone. And accreditors often have annual reports that are due. And um, I, for me, most of the, I work with 10 different accreditors and most of them are due in March or April every year for some reason, and, and, and they're fine. They're not super long, but the idea is if you're going to have people reporting all the time, you better not having them do, have them do too much or they're going to get tired or burnt out. So, Thank you. Yes, we have the question in the chat now. Thank I you. Will. Yes, it's by Mariam Khan of Business Department, and she's saying that there's a lot of coursework uh, both theory and practical. So students are less motivated in just three credit core, uh, credit scores. Can there be a better way of incentivizing them, perhaps increasing credit hours? Um, uh, what do you say to that? I wouldn't have thought that increasing or decreasing the credit hours would incentivize, but perhaps not. Well, you know, it's a great question. And thank you for going to the links to making sure I could hear it. I apologize for, for not being able to hear that. Um, it's tough. That's a really tough question. For me, 
I don't know that changing the credit hours would, unless, okay, if you were changing the total proportion of which a course counted for the program, sure, I think students would take it more seriously. But if you up one course from three to four hours, and then the other courses are going to say, well, I want to be more course, uh, uh, more credit hours too. And so I don't know that that will solve the problem in a sustainable way, um, because then there's going to be conversations about, well, should we adjust the credit hours of other courses? One thing that really has helped in uh, my academic program, which is higher education administration, is sitting students down and having a conversation with them about how each course connects with the others. And so if they understand the significance of the piece of the puzzle they're getting right now, they have been more engaged with the material. And so that can happen a variety of ways. You can create a visual about how the program's content arcs over time. Um, obviously, you it sounds like you all have learning outcomes and stuff already, which is great and 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 foundational and that's and that's wonderful. But making sure that you have conversations with students about this is what you're going to learn in this course. This is why it matters. Um, I think that that can be very helpful when trying to motivate students. There's a lot uh, in the educational psychology literature about trying to manipulate in a good way. Manipulate, the word manipulate tends to be uh, thought of as a bad thing, but it can be good. Um, manipulate students to finding intrinsic motivation to, to be more focused on what's happening in the course, to learn it for the sake of learning as opposed to um, some sort of external reward. Um, and providing students with the opportunity to engage in some self-authorship. So um, taking the course content and trying to translate it into their own words um, through assignments, sometimes uh, manipulating the assignments in the classes can help increase motivation as well. Yeah. So that's a whole different science of motivation, <laughs> intrinsic and extra that comes into play and then engagement directly leading into student engagement. Um, there was another question. It's just uh, information that um, uh, I think it's Bob Bretmore from Religious Studies. He's asking about a book, good book on assessment. You saw I, that. I am yeah. digging in my box. Hold on. So I, some of my favorites. Let's you, see. You're getting everything with you, right? <laughs> My favorite book on assessing student learning is called Assessing Student Learning. And oh. based, um, <laughs> it is by a woman named Linda Susky. She's fabulous. And I can send all of these recommendations. Another Wait. book that I really like that could actually get at the motivation question is Student Engagement Techniques by Elizabeth Barkley. It's awesome. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you tell I do assessment for a living? Um, another book that I like for classroom experience is Classroom Assessment Techniques by uh, and, Tom Angelo and Pat Cross. Yeah, this is like a handbook encyclopedia that uh, has been there for a long time and very effective. Yeah. Yeah. So those are some of my favorites. I'm happy to send a list. Yeah, please. Um, Please yeah. do what that faculty uh, great. So Bob Beckmore wanted, and there's thanks coming in. And Eric, I, I will now invite uh, Dr. Trimble first to sort of comment on what you have said and how relevant it is. And then, of course, yeah, I wonder if you can see our rector in the uh, rector, Dr. Adelton, in the frame, small pictures. Uh, he's online and he will thank you uh, after Dr. Trimble. Uh, there's another question, G. G. That's very powerful. Okay, capstone course. Uh, Capstone, you know, the projects that come on and uh, just your take on how do you feel it is? It's one of the high impact practices. It has to be good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Capstones are really, really great as long as they're designed very intentionally. I think that, and, and I struggled with this in my career, is I run into capstones that are thrown on because somebody thought it was a good idea to do a capstone. And there was not a ton of correspondence between the capstone and the rest of the academic program. So as long as they're designed well, two thumbs up, totally recommend. I think they're really useful. And to the point brought up earlier, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the chemistry professor, but he made an excellent point. 
it may not make sense to assess uh, ethical development in a student during a chemistry test, but it would certainly fit very well in a capstone, which would necessarily rest on chemistry knowledge if it was a capstone for a chemistry program. So um, I think they're they're really wonderful and exceptionally good evidence for program review and accreditation. Yeah, thank you so much. Over to Dr. Trimble, Erica. It was great to see you and hear you. Yeah. Dr. Eckert, I really appreciate your uh, your comments about, particularly as they relate not only to institutional effectiveness writ large, but the way that you moved the conversation uh, specifically to our mission statement um, and to looking at the HEC and NETSI, knowing that those are our concern. So those were very helpful. Um, the challenges that you laid before us are ones that we are going to wrestle with uh, soon and for a long time, uh, particularly what is good enough and then how do we define that and what sort of evidence do we use uh, to bring to that table. Um, these are absolutely necessary for us to wrestle with, uh, and I just thank you for, uh, for highlighting that for us. And this issue of program review, I think this is very helpful for us. Um, we are laser focused right now on uh, assessment of program learning outcomes. Awesome. Uh, that has to be uh, one component of a larger review that it's going to be necessary for the accreditors. And thank you for bringing that to attention, helping us to think through some of the necessary components for that. And um, uh, Kinza and I, she's uh, our um, watermark coordinator. We benefited very much from watching some training that you had done for us earlier. So thank you for your contribution there. Um, and for helping us to give us a context for how an assessment management system will help us to move forward. Watermark being one of those, the ones we happen to adopt, but um, putting that into a larger context, this isn't a, like a watermark sales pitch. This is about what does it mean for institutional effectiveness at, in our context? And you helped us to think through that very well. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you for that. Dr. Adelson, over to you, the rector of Bacan. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ekstan, and thank you, uh, Dr. Eckert, uh, Erica, as well. Um, very much appreciated. I'll be very brief because we're finishing. Uh, you may be opening your day there, but here we are uh, finishing. I think it's been a, a wonderful first day of our faculty retreat, uh, and this actually is a nice way to uh, to conclude it. Um, definitely appreciate. We we benefit from your expertise. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess I just might say that uh, a lot of this is in the context of the NECHI accreditation process we're going through, um, but it's actually not just NECHI because we do multiple accreditations in Pakistan at various in institutions. And so this is, you know, again, partly about credit, about the NECHI, you know, the U.S. accreditation, but very much about some of the accreditation bodies in Pakistan, too. Um, and so I think in that context, it's... Uh, uh, it's definitely useful. Um, and the whole part of this, by the way, just in terms of even taking the step for NECHI, is I think these are steps that will make us a better institution. Uh, so we're very uh, uh, we're, we're, we're very interested in that. I guess just the, the, the conclusion, I don't know if you've been to Pakistan or, or, or this part of Asia, uh, but oftentimes the, the context is that it's called a vote of thanks. And it's the way oftentimes conferences, seminars include, conclude is that someone says, well, a vote of thanks to the speakers, a vote of thanks to the participants. Uh, but this is a very sincere vote of thanks to you uh, for connecting all the way this distance. And, uh, and again, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, thank you for having me. It sounds like y'all are well on your way um, and doing really great stuff. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Erica. I really appreciate, you know, you coming forward so quickly and despite all your own heavy load of work. And thanks again and look forward to keeping in touch and learning more from you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you all. Thank you for being with us throughout the day. Thank you for keeping me energetic and on my toes. And it's a delight to hear you always uh, so look forward to another plenary tomorrow. And just to remind you that on day after, on September 7, you are again expected to be here. And we hope to give a rousing welcome to the Vice Chancellor of Lums University, who desired to be here and see the campus himself. 
And so it will be great for you to be there and to make a personal, you know, effort to be here on the campus. So see you and do let us know if there's something you want us to improve. Look forward to. Thank you so much. Thank you.